morning's scripture reading is from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Please be seated. If you follow it along in that reading, you stay right there. We're going to notice that text together in just a moment. So glad that you're here. We, I have been thrilled to be here the last couple of days and been treated so well. It's fantastic to hear what I, who I believe is one of the finest uh, proclaimers of the Word of God and Kenny Chumley. It's good to see him again and listen to him. <clears throat> good to be with all of you. Good to be with you yesterday at the potluck, Lopez's home. <clears throat> Man, there was a lot of food. <clears throat> And I, uh, I don't think I've eaten that much in a long time. Tried to cut back a little bit and lose a couple of pounds. And, uh, you know, I, I ate a lot, but at least it wasn't, you know, right before you have to get up and speak. So that was good. You know, maybe I've shared with you the story of, of the, the visiting preacher. He went, went to someone's home and they had this big meal. You know, he, they were supposed to, he was supposed to preach that night. And she offered him seconds and thirds, and, and he said, you know, you don't understand. I've got to preach in a little while, and if I eat much more, I won't be able to preach very good. And she gave him seconds anyway, you know, and thirds. She goes, no, I, if you give me any more, I won't be able to preach very good tonight. And finally, there were desserts, and she was just, you know, over and over, just offered him more to eat. And he says, no, you don't understand. I, I won't be able to breathe very well. I won't be able to preach very good. Anyway, later on, they all went to services, <clears throat> and for some reason, the woman of the home, she wasn't feeling well. She wasn't able to go, and so when her husband came home later after services, she said, well, how did he do? And he said, well, he might as well have eaten. <laughs> so, and I, and I ate. I ate good, so. So. <clears throat> It's good to be with my dad again and spend time with him and Geraldine. Great to be with and to stay with Dale and Deanne. I, I just don't even have words to explain my love and my pride for Dale and Deanne uh, Bove. They are just special people in so many ways, and I know how much you love them and you appreciate them, and I'm so glad that they're here to help you in this work. I have so much admiration for my sister, always have, and uh, to, to see the way that Dale has turned into the man of God. Uh, he has just fills my heart with joy. And so glad that he's, uh, is, I suppose, as much like a, a brother that I've never had. Um, appreciate them so much and just the tender relationship that you all have for one another. As much as I love the brethren here, I would be deluding myself and to think that you sometimes don't have some of the same kinds of problems that we have as a congregation of God's people in, in Tampa. We have the same kinds of problems of, as other congregations of God's people. We have problems with unfaithfulness and worldliness and apathy and indifference and lethargy and cliques and fussing and hating and all of these kinds of things that sometimes develop in the lives of the children of God. I hope that a proper application of what we're going to look at this morning will go a long way to solving some of these kinds of problems. And our text will be almost exclusively from the passage that was just read. 
And I hope to be able to demonstrate for you this morning that this book stresses the importance of the Word of God really throughout the whole book, the whole Bible, the importance of the Word of God, something I feel is sorely lacking as a society, for sure, but in some ways, even in congregations of God's people. I believe that the book stresses the importance of the Word of God, even from the opening statement, which is one of the most beautifully constructed sentences, not only in all of literature, but certainly even in all of the Bible, as the author proclaims that God has spoken. When you strip away all the modifying phrases of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, the main sentence structure is simply this, God has spoken. He used to speak in times past by the fathers and the prophets, but in these last days has spoken to us through and in his Son. One of the problems that the author of the book of Hebrews is facing is how do I motivate these Christians to be more faithful in their service unto God? I mean, these were Christians who had tasted the good word of God in chapter 6, verse 5. These were Christians who had received the knowledge of truth in chapter 10, verse 26, but they were drifting away from it in chapter 2, verse 1. Do you know anybody like that? Do you know anybody who might be drifting away from the word of God? These brethren were. And they were developing an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Chapter 3, verse 12. And so the author stresses that they need to give the more earnest heed to the things that they have heard. They need to give the more earnest heed to the word of God. Chapter 2, verse 1. How do you do that? How do you do that in your life? It's an admonition, certainly not just for the Hebrews, which is really a collection of Christians in the Judea area. This was not unlike some of the New Testament books written to one particular church. The book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians in the greater area, all of those Christians, and he is admonishing them to give the more earnest heed to the things which they had heard. How do you do that today? You listen to a good gospel sermon by Brother Bill or one of the elders or somebody teaches a Bible class. But how do you give the more earnest heed to the Word of God? And so the author here makes a powerful argument as to why the Word of God matters. Notice chapter 4, verse 12, again in our reading. Chapter 4, verse 12. In chapter 4, verse 12, we have a very picturesque description of the Word of God and its capabilities. He says in chapter 4, verse 12, For the Word of God is living, or quick, depending on the version you have. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That describes your Bible and mine. A couple things about this. First of all, we can see the importance of God's Word in that verse. And secondly, we can see an entire overview of the whole book in that verse. And so the author begins in verse 12 by saying that the Word of God is quick. In the King James Version, it says quick. Or it might say in another version, it might say living. It is the living word of the living God. But what does it mean to say that the word of God is alive? It means that the word of God is relevant. It means that the word of God is applicable. It means that your Bible and mine continues to speak to mankind of all time, demanding a response from them. If you become evangelistic like I want to be, like we talked about earlier, you're going to go out and talk to people. And I've gotten fond of saying things like this. Please understand, God is not who you think he is. God is who he says he is. And salvation is not what you think it is or what you feel like it might be. Salvation belongs to God. Salvation is determined by God. We simply have to say, I'm willing to obey. True and acceptable worship has nothing to do with what you feel or think and your opinion about anything. True and acceptable worship is whatever God has spelled out for us in the Word of God. We must be people of the book. We need to read then the Bible. It is relevant. It is applicable. It continues to speak to us today just as it did when it was initially penned. 
There are a lot of people today that treat that treat the Word of God as just a collection, uh, a, a collection of ancient religious writings that once accumulated sort of just lost their sizzle, lost their importance, lost their relevance, just cold words on a page. But it lives. The Bible says about itself that it lives. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, he describes the word of God as ever living and abiding. It ever liveth and abideth. Did you think about that? The word of God ever liveth and abideth and fadeth not away. And secondly, he says in verse 12 that the word of God is powerful. The word powerful in English means active and energizing and meaningful and purposeful and vibrant. And the Greek word there found in verse 12 for powerful is energase, energase, E-N-E-R-G-A-I-S. And you can tell by listening that we get our English word energy or energetic from that term. Isn't that cool? And indeed the word of God is active and it is energizing and certainly it is powerful. And he Expresses the ways that the Word of God is powerful in a number of ways throughout the book. I'm just going to suggest a couple of them to you. In chapter 11, verse 3, he says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. That's power to create. That a whole universe sprang into existence from nothing simply because God said for it to. <laughs> you and I can't even fathom that kind of power. We can't even think about that. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the text says he is able to uphold all things by the word of his power. That's the power for God to sustain and to perpetuate things that he wants to keep going in the skies and the world and the mountains and the rivers and the rain and the trees and all of these things. God is in control of all of that. He sustains us. He keeps all things in good working order. And he does so as not some, you know, with some atlas with the world or the globe on his shoulder as we've seen when we were little. But he governs it all. And he directs everything by the great power of his word. Thirdly, the power to prove. The power to prove. In the first few verses of chapter 1, when you strip away those modifying phrases, you get this one 108 word beautiful masterful sentence that basically says God has spoken and you better listen to him in chapter 3 verse 7 he says today that if you'll hear my voice and he attributes that to the Holy Spirit verse but in verse chapter 4 verse 7 he quotes the same verse and he attributes it unto David it was David that was doing doing the speaking through the Holy Spirit. And just as the Holy Spirit spoke in chapter 3, verse 7, likewise David is speaking through the same inspiration of the same Spirit in chapter 4, verse 7. God is speaking through them, and we need to understand the power of God's Word because of its inspiration. There are many people today that deny the full, the verbal, complete inspiration of Scripture. There's a tremendous debate raging and has for a long time about the authenticity of Scripture, the legitimacy of Scripture belonging to the breath of God, that it belongs to Him, that He has spoken Scripture into existence. The Apostle Paul didn't say most Scripture. He said all Scripture is inspired of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man or woman of God might be thoroughly equipped, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. By the way, that tells us we don't need anything other than the Bible to get us from here to heaven. We don't know creed book. We need no denominational outline. We, know, we need nothing else from the mind of a man. The Bible is complete. And so we can see from this book and the rest of the Word of God, His power to prove that those things are right. Let me say something else. There's nothing wrong in our preaching and our teaching with me or Bill or Kenny or anybody else in using statistics and literature or humor or an illustration. But let's remember one thing, and those of us that preach need to remember this, that all an illustration does is illustrate. It does not prove. It remains for the power of the Word of God to prove what is true or right. 
Let me say something else, not to get off on a tangent, but I've been saying this a lot lately. Nothing in the world that you've ever done is right just because you've always done it that way. Neither is anything wrong because you never have. Let's remember that. Nothing is right because you've always done it this way, and nothing is wrong because you never have. Something is right or wrong because God said something about it. I'm sure glad I got some amens on that point. <laughs> and lastly, regarding the, the powerful nature of the Word of God, it has the power to save. This is something that I need to remember every morning when I wake up. So we talked about in our Bible class today. I need to remember God's word has the power to save. In chapter 2, verse 1, he admonishes people to give heed to the things that they have heard. And in a sense, he's saying that the word of God is powerful enough to condemn you if you drift away from it. He says, give heed to the word. He says, give heed to the word of God. Why? Well, every transgression and every disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Well, why is that? Well, because the word is steadfast. And he says, and likewise, I shall, how shall we escape the condemnation of God if we neglect such a great salvation? The word of God is powerful enough to save us, but only if we heed the message found in it. Not because you think God's going to wake up on a particularly good mood come the day of judgment. He's going to welcome you into his eternal home. God says what he means. And he means what he says. And I can't arbitrate. I can't equivocate. I can't barter with God about anything. He is the creator. We are the creation. You ever see the relationship to those words? He is the creator. I am the creature. I belong to him. I owe him my obedience in every way. I understand that's a hard time. That's a hard thing for a lot of people. That is tough sledding for a lot of people to obey God. You're going to get to heaven. You're going to obey the word of God. And we need to understand, and this is important that you and I understand this, that it is only by the power of the Word of God that people are going to truly be saved today. It's only by the power of the Word of God that they can be converted, truly converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that people are going to be motivated to be faithful children of God in their service. It's imperative that you and I understand that. We may be able to get people to come to our church services by a friendly smile and a warm handshake or your charm or your charisma or someone's speaking ability or the good location, all of, all of those things are peripheral. Heard about a preacher many years ago when I was a kid, but the preacher went to visit a man who had become unfaithful in his attendance and he started talking about all the reasons why he needed to come back to services. And he even said, you need to come back because we need your contribution and we might lose the building without it. And shame on that preacher. That man needs to come back because he needs to have his soul saved. It needs to be right with God. Everything else is peripheral. And the things that are going to motivate somebody to be faithful to God is that the Bible is read and preached and taught and then lived out in my life and yours. We may be able to get people to like us, but if we're going to get people to love Jesus, we're going to have to talk about and they have to motivate them from the truth found in the Word of God. And I, f I find it a remarkable thing, and the more I study and the more I try to become a better Bible student, I find it continually a more remarkable thing that here what this author does is goes back to these people who are slipping away. What a fatalistic, horrifying, dangerous thing for anybody to be slipping in their faith. And what this author does is he goes back and he tells them about the masterful scheme of redemption, the superiority of Christ in every way, how he is the better way than anything found in the old law. The reason why the Messiah had to come, the singularity of his death and the meaning of the blood sacrifice. 
And I'll tell you something, if that's not enough to spark the heart of an unfaithful child of God to come back, then nothing I can say or do to persuade them will. They need to understand the powerful nature of the word of God. But thirdly, back to our text, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Notice the verse. The Hebrew author says that the word of God is piercing, piercing. He says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. There are frequent comparisons in the Bible between the Bible and a sword, but here it's a little different. Here the comparison has to do with sharpness. It is sharper, sharper than any two-edged sword. And the reason why it has to be so sharp is so that it might pierce or penetrate your heart <laughs> and mine when our hearts and our minds become hardened and calloused with sin. It needs to be piercing and sharp enough to pierce through our hard and our calloused hearts. The word pierce literally means to penetrate or to go through. And here it's pictured as penetrating deeply or completely all the way to your heart. Do we understand when we hold up our Bible what we are holding? The breath of God, the word of God in our Bibles. The word of God is like, as one author says, a surgeon's scalpel, which can cut us and lay us fully open to examination and inspection. There's really no part of our lives that are untouched by scripture. By the way, you might think you've committed some private sin. I got news for you. Nothing is private to God. He says all things are naked and open under the eyes with whom we have to do. He sees all. He knows all. You can't hide anything from God. And so it is with the Bible in the same way. It lays us open to inspection, able to penetrate us deeply, all the way to my sincerity. The word of God pierces us completely. It's obvious that a man and a woman may not be what they appear to be to other people. The word of God makes that discerning ability. God knows. You can't fake with him. You can't fool with him. He sees everything. And fourthly, according to our text, it says that the word of God is discerning. Now, the word to discern literally means to judge and to analyze. It means in this particular case that it is a judge of our sincerity and a judge of our motives, even to the thoughts and the intents of your heart and mind. The word of God pierces us that deeply and is a judge of how sincere we are in what we do. It's not just what you do, <laughs> you know. It's why you do what you do, too. That will all be factored into judgment. Did you know that? It's why you do what you do. So now let's take a look at this. Let's look at this and sort of summarize that particular verse. I think what we're seeing in that verse is a very natural progression in thought. The word is alive. And therefore, it's active. And in this particular case, the activity takes the form of a sharp instrument which can pierce and penetrate deeply all the way to the heart, discerning our sincerity and our motives. What a beautiful personification being given to the word of God here. Now notice verse 11, back up. Notice verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent or labor to enter into that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. The word for is the first word in verse 12. For is indicative of purpose. Labor to enter into that rest for the word of God is. The nature of the Bible is such that it enforces and demands the exhortation that has just been given in the previous verse. Labor and work and exert and be diligent for the word of God is. <laughs> He's given us a reason why we need to work hard to enter into the rest of God. Paul says, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know as your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Labor. Work. 
be diligent. And then we will have eternal rest in God. Well, how does all that stuff apply to us today? Well, I mean, if we fail to see ourselves in this description, we will have missed the whole point. How much, how important is the Word of God in your life? How important is the Word of God in my life? Well, it needs to be the active energizing force within my life because it pierces all the way to my heart and it judges my motives. The Bible is not some collection of ancient writings that have just become just cold words on a page, just kind of good, general, ethical, moral reading. No. The Word of God is His words to you. What is your definition of faith, by the way? How would you describe that to somebody? A lot of people talk about faith. Oh, I have faith in God. The elders down there are working with one woman right now about this very, very point. Because she says, oh, I've got faith in God. I've never left Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, I've got, she says, and I quote, she says, I've got a powerful relationship with Jesus Christ. But she never comes to services. She's not on our devotional calls every morning at 9 o'clock. She rarely comes to our Bible classes. And she puts her work before the Lord. I mean, how in the world are you going to demonstrate your faith when you say, I've got a powerful faith in Jesus Christ? Well, that should be easily seen somehow. What's your definition of faith? Well, let me tell you what faith isn't. Faith is more than knowing facts. Faith is more than believing a certain set of facts. Faith is trusting in God. Trusting in God so much to the point that you're going to let Him direct you in everything that you do. Faith must be the steering wheel in your lives that guides you into every turn and every decision that you make. heard an interesting comparison a few years ago to com comparing our Bible study to a cadaver religion and how, how he made the point that we use our Bible the way a medical student uses a cadaver. And he says, well, a medical student will take that cadaver, which is a dead animal, you know, a frog or a squirrel or a rabbit or whatever they work on in the labs these days. He says, the medical student will take that dead animal, they'll open it up, they'll dissect it, they'll learn all of its qualities, they'll familiarize themselves with every aspect of it, but there's one thing that that medical student, as gifted and as knowledgeable as they are, there's one thing they can't do to that cadaver, they can't give it life. And I think sometimes that's the way we are with the Bible sometimes. We open it up, we dissect it, we read it, and then we walk away unchanged. <laughs> Me too. I'm guilty of that. The Bible is there to dissect me and open me up and transform my life. And every time we interact with the Bible, we ought to come away changed. We must be a people who have more than just the knowledge of Scripture. Here's what I need to work on. I need to be a man who has been impacted by its message. And there's a big difference in knowing Scripture and being faithful to the Word. The Word of God is intended to transform us. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, would not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The religion of Jesus Christ is, is such a mental, a mental, spiritual, emotional thing that compels us to obedience. He says, rather though, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Greek word there is metamorpho. -o. And you can tell by listening, we get our English word metamorphosis from that term. And you know what a metamorphosis is. You good Bible students, you students at school, you see the way a, cater a, a caterpillar, I always get this mixed up, a caterpillar turns into a butterfly, right? And a, ta a, a tadpole turns into a frog, right? So that is a real metamorphosis. <laughs> and just so when we interact with the Bible, we are changed to become more like Jesus Christ. I don't know how you would describe if somebody came up to you, hey, how to describe your religion for me? Describe your faith. I, I don't know how you would do that. Let me ask you a question. 
How many of you on the way over here this morning, just this morning, thought about your spare tire? Not one of you? That's a pretty important part of your car. You never even thought about it? You didn't check on it? Hey, how you doing back there? You everything okay? You know what we do with our spare tire? We put it in the trunk of our car, and then we continually neglect it. We don't even think about it. We never check in on it. We don't say anything to it until we have an emergency, and then we want to whip that spare tire out. Oh, I'm so glad that you're here. So glad I've got my spare tire now. And nobody thought about your spare tire? Seriously? Okay. You know what a lot of people do? They treat their faith the same way. They have the faith in the back of their minds, in the trunk of their minds. They constantly neglect it. They never check on it. They never evaluate it. They never cultivate it. They never grow it until you have an emergency. And now we want to whip our faith out. Oh, now I believe in God. God, please help me now. I want to tell you that won't do with God. There's a Buddhist teacher that said many years ago, to know and not do is to not really know. I wish I'd been smart enough to come up with something like that. But I'm not that smart. But isn't that what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 11, when he asked this rhetorical question? A rhetorical question is a question that needs no answer because the answer is self-evident within the question itself. And he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? He wasn't really waiting for an answer. <laughs> it's kind of like you're driving along the highway. And you see in your rearview mirror, you see the blue and the red lights. And you pull over and the officer comes up to the window. And you roll that window down, you being a good citizen, right? And he says, don't you know that the speed limit is 65 miles an hour? Here's a tip. He's not asking for information. <laughs> He's trying to make a point in correlating your knowledge and your behavior. In other words, why do you know what the speed limit is there, but you're going to speed anyway? Why do we sometimes know the things that are wrong, but we do them anyway? That's why men, especially men, who are too big and puffed up and proud to say, I need help. Every man or woman of God needs help. I desperately need help. I need strength. I need to pray and study and worship. So many people, we were just talking a little while ago with a couple of ladies, I won't tell you who, talking about dyeing our hair. And I'm getting to the point where I'm thinking about dyeing some of mine. I remember when I was a kid, I don't even know if it's still out. Bro cream? Remember bro cream, the old commercial, just a little dabble, do you? <laughs> I think a lot of people are like that with their religion. And we come to church and we put on our Sunday's best and we worship for an hour or two and then we go home and we live like the rest of the world for the rest of the week and then we come back and we start the cycle all over again. Leave here, Nick referred to it earlier, we get out of here as quickly as we can. Maybe we neglect our brethren, some brother or sister who desperately needs to be encouraged today, maybe. And we get out of here as soon as we can because we want lunch and lunch is waiting and something's burning on the crock pot or we might be behind somebody, we might be behind somebody at the restaurant. Just a little dabble, do you? And we rush home and we watch the Chicago Bears lose again. I'll tell you, a little dab might do you with your hair, but it certainly won't do with God. We use the terminology, music is his life. Sports is his life. He lives for his work. We know exactly what that means, don't we? That in that particular area, a man finds all meaning and purpose and satisfaction and contentment in that part of their life. 
That's a great, it's an unfortunate, but it's a great summary way that a lot of people can apply to their lives. He lives for his work. She lives for this. She lives for that. But now notice what the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. He says, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God, when Christ who is our life. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, will appear with him in glory. And isn't that what it's all about? Earlier we were talking about, in our class, personal work. We were talking about how maybe we're not the instruments that we need to be in talking to people about the Lord. There's a story, I don't know if I ever shared this with you, out in Pennsylvania, a number of years ago, there was a, a really bad train wreck. Two trains had apparently collided, or one train had become derailed, and it was a passenger train. There were about 90 or 100 passengers on this train. And there were a lot of people that were killed, and many people that were injured, dying at the scene. And there happened to be a, a couple of nurses on the train, and one of them tells this story she said she walked up to a man who was sort of muttering to himself. And he had it sitting off the side of the tracks there. He wasn't badly injured. He had his head in, sort of down like this, his head in his hands. And he says, my instruments, my instruments. She didn't know what he meant. She went to check on somebody else who needed her attention. He, she, he, she came back a few minutes later and he was saying something about his instruments. And so finally later on, when a lot of the damage had been cleaned up, she walked up to this man and she said, Sir, you were saying something about your instruments. I didn't know what you meant. She said, young, he said, Young lady, all these years I've been a surgeon and I could have helped a lot of people here today in this accident, but I didn't have my instruments, my doctoring instruments to help them. I couldn't help but think when I read that. God has his instruments but what are we doing for him? We are his chosen nation. We are his instruments. Let us be involved as best we can in getting other people to see and appreciate and then respond to the powerful word of God. I know I can do better. If you follow into your book, let's turn your book to the invitation song that's been selected. We're going to stand and sing this song, encouraging you to respond, to obey, be baptized into Christ, have your sins washed away, be a new creature in Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. If you've done that in some primary way in the years before, but you've drifted away, you know it, and maybe others know it, that you're not as faithful as you could be. I know every single person here just wants you to be better, wants you to be more faithful, all together faithful to God. If we can help you in any way, come to the front as we stand and sing.